Hi, church. Good morning. It's Sunday, and we are moving into the Lord's time. So if you would prepare your hearts and minds with me, let's start in prayer. Dear Lord, we come to you as your children, blessed and beloved. We come to you knowing that each of us is walking unique paths in this time. Be with those, Lord, who are in need of your special care. Be with your children who are in hospital, in hospice, who are, Lord, struggling to find their story lived out in you. For those who are unemployed, for those who are overemployed, for those who are being oppressed, for those who are the oppressor. Lord, into all things and in all times, we know you are with us. Into our times when time goes so slow and into our time when time goes so fast. You surround us with your grace and mercy and we come to you because we are your children and we know that you are a parent who provides even in challenging times, if not more so. So for all this, we give you thanks and say amen. I don't like the term, the new normal. First off, what is normal to begin with? My normal and your normal are never the same. People with addictions, disabilities, oppressive relationships, bullying, success in employment, retirement, grief, we're never facing the same world. Our perspectives shift what we see. We could all look at the same moment in time, but come away with very different emotions, responses, and next steps. Who we are is what makes our experience. Who we're surrounded by, how we were raised, what our culture has declared into us, all of that affects what we see and do. A person's life journey is unique. That's what makes it so amazing. Maybe that's a little bit of my postmodern theology put on you. Postmodern is after modern. Um, it's this idea that we don't like boxing people in. I don't like labels. And I feel like this new normal is another label. But there's something else to it. So I got to searching this week, and I came across a nice letter from the Georgia Department of Behavioral Health and Developmental Disabilities. And I want to read you the last two paragraphs of this letter. The term the new normal does not resonate with me, as I am not sure that the times ahead will be normal. There is important work to be done to understand the impact of racial inequality and the impact of isolation for people with disabilities of all kinds. These issues are of great concern to me. I prefer to think of our pathway ahead as a customized coexistence with COVID-19. Increasing numbers of positive tests suggest that the spread of this insidious illness will be a burden for the foreseeable future. We will have to adjust repeatedly at the level of individuals we serve, treatment modulates, and across facilities and service sites. This will require fortitude and grace as we learn to embrace constant change. Even with these daunting perspectives, we know this. We are in this together. Sustainable solutions require collaboration. We are going to have to listen more openly about what's working and what's not in hospital and community settings. We have to lift up voices that have not yet been heard to truly be of service. While we await a COVID-19 vaccine, we have to continue to foster hope, which is our only vaccine against uncertainty. We have to believe in our collective ability to emerge with more effective and responsive strategies. I do believe this is possible, and I hope you'll join us in this mission to ensure that the drive to support recovery and independence remains our guiding vision. That, as I said, is from the Georgia Department of Behavioral Health and Developmental Disabilities. I love that. I love that a government health program would say lines like, listen to these two in particular, this will require fortitude and grace as we learn to embrace constant change. And we have to continue to foster hope, which is our only vaccine against uncertainty. Don't you love that? Those words? It isn't a new normal that we're living into. It's a life which requires fortitude, grace, embracing constant change, and fostering hope. How Christian is that message? This has been our normal from the beginning. Our normal of living into faith living into crisis with courage and hope 
That's how our church, how our faith has lived from the very beginning of our time. And we all need to remember this, don't we? This week I read an article that began, we are losing the war on coronavirus. This kind of stuff is exhausting, isn't it? It's overwhelming and it keeps going. Many of you watching this today are what, having what we could say is crisis fatigue. We're experiencing it. Years down the road, we're going to be experiencing something called post-traumatic stress syndrome, just like soldiers do. But we're not post yet, are we? We're not even close yet. So where is the hope? Where is the source of our strength in the midst of all this? Whatever you're going through, for some of you, it is friends that are getting sick. For some of you, it's self that is getting sick. For some of you, it is grief at what's going on in your employment. Some of you, it's frustration on what you're reading on Facebook, by vice and back and forth from between people for politicalness or mask discussions, all kinds of stuff, right? So I asked the Lord to show me answer to where is the hope this week for you and for me. And you know what stood out to me in the book of Acts is a line. It's the line that says, if you have any word of encouragement for the people, come and give it. How do you preach to the brokenhearted, the grief-stricken, the lost, the frustrated, the divided, the bored, the sick, the healthy, but locked in, the unemployed, the seeking employment, the scared because they're re-employed, the youth wondering will they have school, the teachers wondering if they'll have school, the people wondering will I live through the year, the people struggling as cancer fighters, the people living as cancer survivors, the anorexic, the overeater. See? The variety of our world. How do you do it? You do it the same way that Paul showed us how he did it in Acts 13, 13 to 52. When someone, anyone, needs a word of encouragement, this, friends, this is what it says, this, friends, is that word of encouragement that he's going to share. So if you have your Bible out and you want to jump to Acts 13, 13 to 52, this is the something that can put us all on the same path. Our need for encouragement is the same. Our need for hope, our need for assurance, our need for peace is the same. And how do we find it? Paul reminds us Jesus Christ is our word of encouragement. The one man who not only suffers, but offers all. Who lived, who died, who created salvation so that we could have it. There's nothing different. There's no new normal. He was the new normal years ago. And we'll see where that happens today. But for us, the same answer is the same as it always was. In all times, in all places, for all. It's Jesus Christ. Now, some of you are thinking, what about other religions? And I'm not getting into that with this right now. I have a background in interfaith dialogue. I'd be happy to talk with you about this. But what I'm talking about is, when we're hopeless, where is our hope? And it is the same message that it was for those in the first century. Paul's sermons in Acts 13 is the answer we all need right now, just as they needed it then. In fact, in the Message Bible, Eugene Peterson will have Paul saying, and we're here today bringing you good news, the message that what God promised the fathers has come true for the children, for us. This is for us, the children of God. Acts 13 sermon is the longest recorded sermon from Paul in the New Testament. It is Luke's retelling of a sermon that Paul stands up and gives. This is not a letter. The letters are longer, of course, Romans, 1 Corinthians, but those are letters. This is a sermon. This is what Luke, the gospel writer, remembers is, is said by Paul. It's how he heard it, and that's what he wrote down. These are not Paul's exact words. This is what Luke heard from the sermon. So if any of you were to write what you heard today, this is what Luke's doing. And I think it's so important for us that I'm not just going to give you a synopsis. I'm going to literally walk through it with you. Because I think the words of encouragement back then are the words of encouragement for today. Acts 13, 13, we begin. Paul is preaching in Antioch of Pisda. There are a couple Antiochs at the time. Um, so this one, by saying that second word, is telling you which one it is. This is an area that is now Turkey, in the middle of the lakes region of Turkey. Paul would visit here on the first, second, and third journeys of his missionary journeys. And this is the first visit. Now, they probably got to Antioch before the Sabbath day. They probably created some connections with people in the community because we see there's a familiarity with the leaders of the synagogue who trusted Paul to share some good news. 
The Message Bible actually will say the words, Friends, do you have anything you want to say? A word of encouragement, perhaps. But I liked in the NLT version, which is what I was reading this week for myself, it says, Brothers, if you have any word of encouragement for the people, come and give it. So let us hear what Paul comes and gives us. Hmm. Wait. Did I say Paul was speaking in the synagogue? Well, it's not so weird. If you remember, Jesus actually speaks in the synagogues as well. And so they went to the synagogue on the Sabbath. After the usual reading of the books of Moses and the prophets, those in charge of the service asked him if they would get up to speak. So let me tell you a little bit about synagogue services at this time. This is not Jerusalem. This is what we call the diaspora, the people that are dispersed into the world. So we're in a Turkey synagogue. Um, there seems to be kind of a set of order to things, even though they are further out into the world, kind of like a Christian church today. You might expect in any Christian church, there's going to be some prayers, there's going to be some hymns, there's going to be a sermon of some sort, an offering, a scripture reading, right? Those are the things you kind of expect, no matter the denomination. Well, at this time, it would have been the same. There would have been what we call the recitation of the Shema, and that's a Jewish prayer that would center on the oneness of God. It often starts, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Then there would be prayers. There would be a priestly blessing. Scriptures would have been read what they call the Torah. Those are the first five books of the Old Testament, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. They would have a reading from the prophets, Micah, maybe, or Obadiah. And that notion of two readings is something we Christians still do today, right? We have an Old Testament and New Testament reading. There'd be a sermon of sorts, and there'd be a benediction, a blessing and a sending off. Now back to that sermon of sorts. This is what they call the message of exhortation, a message of instruction, encouragement, something that takes the text that was read and pushes it a little further along as a way to connect people to God. So yeah, similar to our sermons. So Paul was asked to do that part, a real honor the person in charge who ran the service and took care of the synagogue must have thought Paul had something to say. Why would he ask a foreign visitor? I don't know. We don't know that part. But we know that God must have been guiding him to do so. And Paul is not going to miss out on the opportunity to speak the good news. If you notice through a lot of these sermons that we've been talking about with Acts, Paul is never going to miss out on an opportunity to share the good news. So Paul stood... Lift and stood is important because in Jewish synagogues you usually sit down, but with the Greeks you stand up, so he's crossing borders here. He lifted his hand to quiet them and started speaking. Men of Israel and you God-fearing Gentiles, listen to me. Yeah, there are different people in the group that day. Just like there are different people in our world today. You could say it's like the Republicans and the Democrats and the Independents and all those in between, right? There are Jews, the Israelites... And there are also Gentiles, Greeks, or Romans, or such. It's important because we see that what Paul's doing is talking to a diverse group of people. A people that are divided. Just like we have today. Men and women, young and elder. Mask wearer, mask defier. You get the picture. So Paul's talking to this group of people that come from different journeys with different places. And what's great about Paul is that he can speak to them because he's both grew up Jewish... So he knows the customs, but he's also a Roman citizen, so he knows the laws. He meets people where they are and allows them to be who they are because he's that way. Okay, so he starts preaching to them. And he starts with the scriptures like they would have thought. He says in verse 17, The God of this nation of Israel chose our ancestors and made them multiply and grow strong during their stay in Egypt. Then with a powerful arm, he led them out of slavery this is what they expected to hear, friends. This is the exodus. If you remember, Moses gets the people out. They go out into the wilderness, right? This is the story they knew. Paul notes next, he put up with them through 40 years of wandering in the wilderness. I love the way he worded that, don't you? God put up with them. God put up with humans. This week, I saw a Facebook picture that has stayed with me, and I'm sorry, I looked through and couldn't find it again, so if you do know about it, please feel free to post it below. It has three cats all behind glass, right? And the first cat is pretty much like, this is the gist that I got of it, right? The first cat's pretty much saying something like, when are we gonna get out of here? Right, they're locked inside during quarantine. And the second cat says, well, it seems something like, you know, until the humans fix the problem and wise up, we're stuck in here. And the third cat's face is like, 
We're never getting out of here. It's funny on some level, isn't it? But it's also heartbreaking. I imagine that's what God feels like sometimes. Putting up with us. Our fighting, our lying, our selfishness. God's just putting up with us sometimes. Paul continues. Then he destroyed seven nations in Cana and gave their land to Israel as an inheritance. All this took about 450 years. After God, that, God gave them judges. Yep, our Bible study we're doing right now. To rule until the time of Samuel the prophet. Then the people begged for a king. God didn't want to give them a king. Remember, they asked for a king. God said, I am your king. And they said, we want another one. So God allowed it. God gave them Saul, son of Kiosh, a man of the tribe of Benjamin, who reigned for 40 years. This is the only reference to the king of Saul in the New Testament. Maybe because Paul's original name was Saul. He had a little kindred ship there. But I don't know. But I think maybe more it shows again how humans mess up the world. Right? God removed Saul, replaced him with David, a man about whom David said, I have found David, son of Jesse, a man after my own heart. Well, we know about David too, don't we? <sighs> he will do everything I want him to do. Well, David did some stuff God didn't want him to do too. So up until this point, Paul is just doing what people thought he would do in a sermon. He's telling them the stories. But on verse 23, something's going to change. A true new normal. The thing that rocks the ultimate world. Verse 23. And it was one of King David's descendants, Jesus, who is God's promised son of Israel. They must have been thinking, what the heck is he talking about? Who is this? They're, he's diverged completely from what they thought he was doing. Here he was telling this story about where God had been in the world. But then all of a sudden he's like, whoosh. Shifting sands. Their world changes. No longer the same. He understands, though, that this is hard, so he gives him a gradual bridge in the sermon. He talks about John the Baptist. Now, John the Baptist was a type of a scene, which is a group of Jewish people. They wrote the Dead Sea Scrolls, right? And he, he was one that they probably would have heard about the Essenes, and they would have felt marginally comfortable with this. So he tells about him first. Verse 24, before he came, John the Baptist preached that all the people of Israel need to repent of their sins and turn to God and be baptized. As John was finishing his ministry, he asked, you ready for this again? Do you think I am the Messiah? No, I am not. But he is coming soon, and not even worthy to be his slave, and to tie the sandals on his feet. Verse 26. Brothers, you sons of Adam, and you God-fearing Gentiles. And we'll go, sisters, you daughters of Ab Abraham, and you God-fearing Gentiles. This message of salvation has been sent to us. This is it, friends. This is where our hope lies. This is our word of encouragement. For that time, for this time, for all time, it's the same word of encouragement, the same word that you need to hear, the same word I need to hear, the same word your neighbors need to hear. This is it. This message of salvation has been sent to us. No matter what you're facing right now, no matter what your needs are, remember that your greatest need has already been met. Salvation has been sent to us. Paul continues. He tells them about how, and you can read this yourself. I'm going to jump over a little bit. He tells them about how Jesus um, was condemned, how he died, was executed. And he says to them on verse 29, when they had done all the prophecies that said about him, they took him down from the cross and placed him in a tomb. But God raised him from the dead. And over a period of many days, he appeared to those who had gone with him from Galilee to Jerusalem. And now his witnesses to the people of Israel Verse 32, and now we are here to bring you this good news. I love that. It's like somebody, an anchor would say, but I tell you what, this news that Paul is bringing is bigger than you're going to see on CNN, bigger than Fox News, bigger than New York Times, bigger than BBC. So that news you're hearing now that's wearing you down, remember this news. Verse 32, and now we are here to bring you this good news. The promise was made to our ancestors. And God has now fulfilled it for us, their descendants, by raising Jesus. This is what the second psalm said about Jesus. You are my son. Today I have become your father. For God had promised to raise him from the dead, not leaving him to rot in the grave. He said, I will give you a sacred blessing, I promised to David. Another psalm explains it more fully. You will not allow your Holy One to rot in the grave. 
This is not a reference to David, for after David had done the will of God in his own generation, he died and was buried with his ancestors, and his body decayed. No, this was a reference to someone else, someone who God raised and whose body does not decay. What? Paul just said all of that about David in front of a whole group of Jewish people who looked at David as like, whoa. But he's saying he's not the hero that you really need in. He died, but Jesus didn't. Jesus is the hope, not the ending, but the beginning. Jesus is more than death. He's life. Wow. Think about how that would have sat with them back then. Think about how it should sit with us today. He continues, verse 38. Brothers, listen, we are here to proclaim that this man, Jesus, there is forgiveness for your sins. Everyone who believes in him is made right in God's sight. Something the law of Moses, oh, he's dissing Moses, could never do. Be careful. Don't let the prophet's words apply to you. For they said, look, you mockers, be amazed and die. For I am doing something in your own day. Something you wouldn't believe even if somebody told you about it. And that's the end. That final line sends chills through me. Think about it. For I am doing something in your day, something you wouldn't believe, even if someone told you about it. Could this message of Paul be as much for us today? Yeah, it can. God is doing something, friends. And sometimes we don't even believe it. It's so amazing. Why did I spend all this time of this sermon telling you pretty much what Paul is saying? You're like, I could read this on my own, Pastor Shannon. And there's truth there. But the truth is that this is the word of encouragement we need now as much as they needed then. Change is constant, friends. Yes. And Jesus was a huge change. Jesus changed everything. But sometimes history doesn't change. Sometimes history stays the same. As much as the world is changing around us, as much as we feel like we're sinking from these shifting sands under our feet, as much as our new normal seems to be changing everything we know. The true thing that holds us together has not changed. This man, this line that Paul says right here, through this man, Jesus, there is forgiveness for your sins. Everyone who believes in him is made right in God's sight. That is the stability in our lives. No matter what you're feeling, no matter what you're thinking, that's our stability. Jesus is our rock, our redeemer, our sustainer. Whatever else changes, this does not. He is with us. And wherever we are, whenever we are, this will be true. I could tell you funny stories and quick tales in a sermon, and I'll do that on other sermons, and I do. But this longest sermon of Paul's in the New Testament, this is what we need to hear right now, I think. We need to find the right answer when somebody says, Friends? Do you have anything you want to say? A word of encouragement, perhaps? You, friends, can do the same thing I did today. You can say, let me tell you about this verse. Let me tell you about this chapter in the Bible. Because, yeah, it has something to say. Paul's sermon then is as good for us as a sermon now. It is, let me get it back to you, Acts 13, 13 to 52. So if you need something to tell somebody a bit of hope, tell them that. Tell them, yeah, I have some encouragement. I have some good news. Ready for it? Jesus forgives. Jesus saves. Jesus heals. Jesus loves. And Jesus lives. That's all we need. All the rest is extra. The rest doesn't really matter as much when we realize how true this is, how sustaining this truth is for us. I think back to that article I started you with. It said... We have to continue to foster hope, which is our only vaccine against uncertainty. We have a vaccine against uncertainty, friends, and his name is Jesus. Amen.